University was founded in 1974 to open fresh avenues in the lives of people through distance education. Only in a couple of decades, the globe became a replica of the system. Today, open universities operate in the world. Being a pioneer institution in Asia, the Alama Iqbal Open University hosted the Asian Association Open Universities Conference. And now we earnestly prepare to wish all of you a warm welcome again. Every possible measure is being taken to make the international event constructive and comfortable. The conference website has been developed to facilitate registration, queries, and contact. Wi-Fi system is available in the campus for continuous communications. Central library and digital library services will also be available for consultation and reference. To make your stay more comfortable, arrangements are being made in the hotels of international chains. You will be served with a variety of foods, especially the oriental foods, with a blend of spices that will add to your taste. Visits to sites of cultural heritage would make a part of exciting tourism. Domestic handicrafts and products will be your shopping content for family and friends. The Alama Iqbal Open University is making all-out efforts to groom technology-oriented human resource through information and communication technology. Electronic and cyber communication formats are applied in teaching methodology. High-tech electronic software is produced in the Institute of Education Technology. These radio and television programs support the academic content of the university courses. The Center for Instructional Design has recently been established to develop electronic courseware for various programs. The student-centered arrangements also include campus radio, online learning, and educational television. Print materials like books, study guides sent by mail, tutorial instructions, face-to-face -face sessions in clusters of sciences in laboratories, group training workshops, faculties, and academic program. 35 academic departments of four faculties offer 104 programs of studies ranging from secondary level programs to research-based MPhil and PhD programs. The Alama Iqbal Open University ranks among mega universities in the world. We firmly believe in sharing experiences to innovate new structures in distance education. Together, we can enrich the existing practices and explore viable possibilities in education of technology, engineering, agriculture, and medical sciences in open distance learning framework. of technology and information, Universitas Terbuca provides the best services for its students. UT presents one of the superior applications called MyUT. MyUT application is here to make it easier for students to get various information related to learning processes. MyUT application has implemented Single Sign-On Technology, or SSO. This application is an authentication service system to assist students in signing into a site or application. 
With this new system, students only need to sign in with an Office 365 account to enter various applications at once. Students can see personal dashboards through MyUT, including student data and academic development. In this scenario, students will have access to their payment status and a record of their courses. Additionally, they will also be able to access the following features. Announcement and academic calendar. Relevant information that can easily be accessed from WhatsApp and students' email. Easy payment because it has implemented cash and card payment processor or 2C2P technology. Another facility MyUT offers is that students can directly enter online tutorial pages, webinar tutorials, and practicum practices without signing into their respective applications. Likewise, with other services such as registration, teaching materials, examinations, student activities, and graduation, students only need to select the desired services and will automatically enter the desired application. It is also equipped with a chatbot feature to make it easier for students to support their learning process. MyUT also offers other benefits to UT students, including assistance to students in finding exam locations through the examination participant card feature, which seamlessly integrates with exam location maps specific to each UT regional office. The website-based and mobile-based MyUT make it easier for students to get services anywhere and anytime. Adequacy, accessibility and quality of information systems, UT possesses sufficient network facilities, infrastructures and optimal information technology services. UT has a data centre that adheres to Tier 3 standards. The data centre was constructed alongside the Disaster Recovery Centre, DRC situated in separate locations within the same region or island and off-site, outside Java Island. Currently, UT has established two physically distinct DRC locations from the main data center. 1. Gedung Sebaguna, UT's first DRC location, is in a different building in the same area. This location contains a storage server and several servers for backup and emergency replacement servers. 2. DRC Nusantara Data Center, NDC Batam, in collaboration with one of Muratalindo's internet services in Indonesia. UT uses Microsoft Azure and DigitalOcean in the realm of cloud data centers. Regarding servers, each unit at UT's head office and regional offices has approximately 200 virtual servers for data backup and unit application development. This hosting server is managed by the Directorate of Information Systems with more than 50 physical servers installed. UT's internet connection consists of international and domestic internet lines with sufficient bandwidth with a total capacity of 5 GPBS internationally and 10 GBPS nationally using 5 internet service providers or ISPS. 
For internal networks or local area networks or LANs that connect between buildings in UT head office, the fiber cable bandwidth used varies with the backbone of the LAN interbuilding network of 10 GPBS and 1 GBPS for each network subnet. The regional offices of UT possess ample bandwidth capacity, offering speeds ranging from 100 to 200 Mbps. UT regional offices typically subscribe to a single internet service provider, ISP, in the area, such as IndiHome or AstiNet, with different capacities available. Additionally, all office computers are connected to the internal network or local area network. The virtual private network or VPN connection established between the head office and all regional offices of UT offers speeds of up to 10 Mbps with a robust backbone capacity of up to 400 Mbps. The infrastructure is generally utilized for various purposes, including accessing application systems, databases, and communication tools like video conferencing and PABX, and providing internet connectivity. UT provides lecturers and students with various facilities to engage in online learning activities, and access informational resources and enrichment materials. These facilities include 1. eCampus email service, which offers a generous 50 gigabyte inbox capacity and 1 terabyte of integrated OneDrive storage through Office 365. In addition to facilitating communication between students and lecturers. 2. Complementary access to Wi-Fi.id hotspots, which is the result of cooperation between UT and Telcom. These hotspots are available at equipped locations and have been installed across all regional offices of UT. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good afternoon from Jakarta, Indonesia. Please accept my very warm regards. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you all to the sixth episode of the AOU webinar series 2023. The theme of our today webinar is optimizing students' learning experience in open, flexible, distance learning. Today, on the 25th October 2023, we start from 2 p.m. Jakarta time. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I would like to welcome you and I would like to ex express my sincere thanks to all participants who spend your time during your busy day doing your daily activities. And I'm uh, very happy that the president of the AOU, Professor Ojat Rojat, is with us today. And also our keynote speakers, Dr. Maria Aristidou, Associate Professor in Technology Enhanced Learning, from the Open University UK. And it's nice to meet you, and I thank you very much for <laughs> accepting our invitation. I'm sure that your experience and your knowledge will be beneficial to all of us. And the second one, ladies and gentlemen, the second speak keynote speaker is Professor Dr. Santi Ragavan from the Open University of Malaysia. Thank you very much, Professor Santi. It is again nice to meet you. Uh, although today uh, our meeting is separated miles and miles, mm -hmm. but we can meet each other on the screen. Thank you. 
And also, we are quite fortunate. Our moderator today is uh, Dr. Kamran Mir. Uh, I'm sure that uh, you who attend the AOU conference last year and this year know him very well. <laughs> now, I would like first to invite the presidents of DAOU, Professor Ojat Darojat Ambush PhD, and also the Rector of Unisa Serbuka, to open uh, our webinar officially and give us uh, welcoming and opening remarks. Professor Ojat, the screen and mic is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Rahmat. And uh, very good, good afternoon, everyone. Indonesian Jakarta time zone. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, it is a privilege to address you today. We are having the sixth uh, webinar, ASEAN, ASEAN of Open Universities uh, series of 2023. Uh, with our recommendable keynote speakers, as already mentioned by Mr. Ahmad. Uh, so before we start, please join me and uh, welcoming our esteemed AOU members. I would like to extend and warm welcome all distinguished uh, presidents, rectors, vice chancellor of the AOU member institutions. Also our speakers, First speaker, Dr. Maria Aristaido, a PhD, uh, Assistant Professor in Technology and Hands Learning uh, from the uh, Open University, uh, or we call it uh, UKOU, United Kingdom Open University, and a Senior Fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Uh, it is an honor to have you uh, here, Dr. Maria. And the second speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Santi Ragavan, uh, Vice President of OEM. Uh, I know her for a long time. Thank you for coming in this virtual conference. Our moderator who will lead our sessions today, Dr. Kamran Mir, and also all our beloved participants. <clears throat> Uh, this webinar is our opportunity to share our latest development and uh, in open, flexible, and distance learning, and uh, explain how uh, this progress will lead us into our next uh, phase. So the purpose of reach of the internet and the accessibility of the technology have catalyzed uh, a surge in the demand for web-based pedagogy across the nations. <laughs> And educational institutions worldwide employ different communication methodologies to foster effective learning for students' need. So I believe that uh, the topic of our webinar uh, will not only enlighten but also challenge us to uh, adapt uh, and also adopt for this technology to enrich our student learning experiences. So during this webinar, we have the privilege of hearing from uh, experts and also practitioners who have uh, navigated the challenges of, of open, flexible, and distance learning. We are fortunate uh, as uh, Dr. Maria Aristido, PhD, comes from uh, UKOU. I know when I took uh, my dissertation in uh, for a uh, degree in Canada. OU has been regarded as uh, the landmark, as the landmark uh, of ODL in the university level. So it becomes the benchmark of ODL practices, and uh, including ourselves, our university, Indonesia also we uh, uh, conducted studyship. Uh, to UK to get to know more deeply about how uh, you, uh, you, you run uh, in uh, distance uh, learnings. In addition, uh, we also pro 
Dr. Sandi Ragapan, has a very long experience in uh, quality assurance and also in student relations and OUM. When I took a dissertation, uh, and Professor Dr. Sandi Ragapan provided a uh, rich information about that. So together, let us accelerate the exchange of ideas and scaling up of good practices. And I wish you all have a pleasant and successful webinar. Thank you. Back to Mr. Rahman. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned before that our webinar today will be led by Dr. Kamran Mir. Before uh, we start, I would like to share with you a brief information about Kamran Mir. Kamran Mir is an, an EdTech researcher and trainer. He is currently working as Assistant Director IT at Alama Iqbal Open University, or AIOU, Pakistan which is one of the mega open universities in the world and the second oldest open university. I'm also, uh, he's also a research uh, scholar at the National University of Science and Technology, Pakistan, which is ranked number one in Pakistan and is ranked in 2023. His area of research revolves around GIS, Spatial Learning Analytics and Research Education. He is passionate about attack research and teaching. Mr. Kamran has received several international and national awards, including one gold medal and two silver medals from the AAOU as a Young Innovator Awards and first and the second prize from Alama Iqbal Open University and National Idea Bank. He has been awarded three research fellowships from Shanghai Open Universities, University of China, University of Philippines Open University, UPOU, and Anadolu University, Turkey. He has more than 20 research publications in different national, in different national and international journal and conferences. From the brief CV, we know that Mr. Kamran Mir is the right person to lead our discussion. Mr. Kamran Mir, the mic and the screen is offered to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hamad. Um, it is really an honor for me uh, to moderate this very interesting session, which is on optimizing the students' learning experiences in open, flexible, and distance learning. And we have very prominent scholars, prominent research professors with us who will speak on this topic. So before I um, introduce my speakers, let me uh, briefly uh, introduce the guidelines, the webinar guidelines. Uh, yeah. So first of all, before uh, all the participants, uh, I really welcome all of you uh, in this very interesting session. So these are some regulations before you ask any questions. So before sending any question, just mention your name, your institution from which you belong, and the person, the professors who, whom you want to ask the question, because we have two professors uh, who will be talking about, uh, about this topic. And number two regulation is questions will be firstly read by the moderator like me once it is displayed on the screen and thus then the relevant speaker will give the relevant answer. And the last very important thing, what is the requisite to, getting, to get the certificate? We have to fill the registration form in advance. I hope all of you have already done that. And you have to follow the whole program. And after the program, uh, we will share the feedback form so that uh, once you fill up that feedback form, then you will uh, get the certificate. So these are some uh, regulations uh, for this. Uh... Now coming to our first speaker, who is Professor Maria. Let me briefly introduce her. Uh, she's very prominent as already mentioned by Dr. Hamad and uh, our rector as well. Dr. Maria 
she is an associate professor in technology enhanced learning at the open university of uk and she is a senior fellow of a higher education academy she is specializing in designing and evaluating engaging learning technologies while also working to enhance the learning experiences and outcomes of diverse student population dr maria she has provided leadership for the pan university and cross faculty projects aimed at investigating the distance learning experiences of both students and tutors with a primary focus on supporting the student success and she is currently leading a consultation with the tutors to enhance the support for the early learning journey engagement and retention of the distance learning students she is also leading the evaluation of the pan welsh externally funded project which explores the transitions from the further education to higher education in the job market and in the past she conducted research into the students perspectives and preferences regarding online exams as well as experiences of the younger students in the distance learning programs and you can uh, access you can see the publications of dr maria using the link which is mentioned on the screen so she's very well, she's a very right person very right uh, like experienced professor uh, who will talk about uh, the topic of optimizing students learning experience in of deal so i would request dr maria to uh, to enlighten us with this topic please thank you very much kamran <clears throat> can i please confirm you can hear me well yes we can hear you okay thank you thank you very much and thank you for the very warm welcome uh, i am now going to share my screen okay <clears throat> So uh, today's today's talk will focus specifically on the newcomers' experiences and in the way we captured them at the Open University. So I hope it's similar to other universities as well, and how we can improve these experiences if they need improvement. So uh, first, I'm going to say a few words about the Open University, though, in the UK. Uh, because it might be different to how your universities function. So the Open University is an institution with a rich history and a unique approach to education. Um, it was founded in 1969, and it has made significant contributions to higher education with a staggering, a staggering 2.2 million students passing through its doors since its inception. The Open University is not just any educational institution, it's the largest university in the UK. And what makes it stand out is that it primarily caters to part-time students, emphasizing accessibility and flexibility in education. It's renowned for its long tradition of distance learning, making education accessible to those who cannot attend traditional classes, as most of the Open Universities across the world. Um, the Open University's unique partnership with the BBC is what it made Open University to have a global influence. And together they reached over 260 million people world, worldwide, bringing education to all corners of the globe. Um, so notably, over 70% of our students are already in the workforce while pursuing higher education. So they are earning and learning at the same time. And this is what reflects the Open University's dedication to empowering individuals to advance their careers. The Open University's impact, though, goes beyond numbers. 78% of our undergraduates had no prior higher education qualifications. And furthermore, 26% come from the 25% most deprived areas, illustrating the institution's commitment to inclusivity and breaking down barriers. Um, and as we look to the future, the Open University continues to attract younger students, with 34 of new undergraduates being tw under 25 years old at the moment. Um, the Open University in the UK champions an innovative learning model, delivering courses via virtual learning environments, online tutorials, and small tutor groups. And it is a community of learners with unique backgrounds and aspirations. And this characteristic is what makes designing and welcoming a diversity of students challenging. 
Uh, but let's first see how challenging it can be to be a first year university student at any university, according to the literature. So one primary challenge first year students face across universities is adapting to university learning and assessment styles. So university education demands more self-directed learning, emphasizing critical thinking and independent research. This shift in educational approach can be both daunting and difficult for students. For many, this transition to university also means navigating complexities of social life. Uh, this can be especially stressful for younger students as they are also facing changes that affect their learning, relationships, and habits. Um, in addition, younger students at universities face other challenges such as they need to need to function as independent adults. So that can include managing finances, cooking, doing laundry, making responsible decisions about their lives. This shift towards independence can be liberating, but comes with its own set of pressures. Um, these challenges, if they are not addressed effectively, can have profound consequences for first year students. The pressure to excel academically, maintain relationships, and shoulder newfound responsibilities can lead to um, high stress levels. This can be overwhelming, impacting both mental and physical well-being. Struggling with new learning and assessment styles can lead to poor academic performance. Students may find it difficult to meet the rigorous demands of university courses, affecting their grades and their overall learning experience. Uh, if these challenges aren't properly managed, they can lead to increased dropout rates, which we wouldn't like to have. So many first year students overwhelmed by the transition may choose to leave university altogether, missing out on valuable educational opportunities. Uh, another challenge, self-reported by students is feeling unprepared for the more relaxed form of teaching in higher education. This is sometimes compared to school teaching, where the structure and guidance of teachers may have been more pronounced, while university learning tends to be more self-directed and hands-off. Uh, this shift in teaching styles can be disorienting for new students, causing students to question their preparedness for this more independent approach. Also, the fast pace of teaching and learning in higher education can be a shock to students. The workload often feels overwhelming and the speed at which new information is presented can leave students struggling to keep up. This can lead to a sense of being constantly under pressure and falling behind. So to comprehend the challenges faced by first year students is important to explore some underlying reasons. Um, students are expected to be self-motivated, manage their time efficiently and take the lead in their own education. This sudden change from a probably more structured setting or being away from education for some time can create feelings of uncertainty and anxiety. Another contributing factor is the perception of being unprepared for higher education. So students may lack essential study skills, time management abilities, effective note-taking techniques, IT competences, and teamwork skills. Uh, this perceived lack of preparedness can worsen the challenges they face during their transition. So distant learning students, by the very nature of their educational path, often face extra difficulties during their, their social transition to university life. Uh, and this transition involves not just adapting to the academic environment, but also integrating into the university community, fostering a sense of belonging and overall honing essential skills for online learning. So what does the literature say we can do to support our distance learning students? An effective induction program is essential. This program can minimize feelings of isolation by connecting students, guiding them through the online and, and learning environment, 
familiarizing them with university regulations and concepts, facilitating meetings with tutors and support staff, and initiating valuable working relationships with tutors. It's, a, it's an important step in ensuring students feel welcomed and prepared for the challenges ahead. Creating extracurricular and collaborative online spaces is also important. These spaces allow students to learn from each other, guided by an academic leader. Um, this collaborative learning environment fosters interaction and peer support, reducing feelings of isolation and enhancing the overall learning experience. Uh, designing support spaces is also important. These spaces could provide clear guidelines and resource, resources that can help students navigate academic requirements, locate necessary support, access assistance when needed. Um, support spaces serve as a safety net, ensuring that no student will feel lost or left behind. And then facilitating social cohesion is also integral to the distance learning students' experience. By creating opportunities for students to interact, form connections, feel part of a larger university community, a sense of belonging, belonging can be nurtured. And this sense of belonging is a cornerstone of a successful university experience. Um, and finally, prior to the start of the course, conducting a pre-course diagnosis of students' IT skills is very important. This helps identify any gaps in technical competences and allows for tailored support. Addressing IT skills disparities early can prevent students from feeling overwhelmed and support them in their transition to the online learning environment. So all these are things that the literature have already told us. But at the Open University, we are committed to continuously improve this experience of mainly our first year students, who is very crucial to help them have a good experience early at their learning journey. So to achieve this, we recently conducted a comprehensive study to understand a bit better their motivations for studying with us, their early perceptions of distance learning programs and the areas that support a successful transition, as well as those areas that need improvement. Uh, this study involves 377 survey respondents, and these students shared their experiences through the survey, providing valuable quantitative data. Uh, additionally, we conduct in-depth interviews with 12, student, 12 students uh, to understand their experiences in depth. Uh, these findings will not be presented here due to limited time, but I have added the, the resource in the end if you also want to look at that. Um, we started by exploring the motivations of our students using a Likert scale. Um, this allowed us to gouge the various factors that led our students to choose distance learning and enroll with our university. Understanding their motivations was very important to tailor our support systems. Um, and we also analyzed the survey responses to identify the areas that supported a smooth transition for our first year students and those that required improvement. Um, this content analysis of responses helped us to pinpoint specific strengths to celebrate and areas to enhance, ensuring a more successful educational journey. Um, at the point of the survey, students had already spent a minimum of five months studying with the university and had submitted their first formative assignment. Uh, this time allowed us to capture their experiences during this crucial early stage of their academic journey, providing data that can guide immediate and long-term improvements. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we asked our students what motivated them to join at distance learning institutions. We provided them with some sta statements that we had collected across the years through our marketing department when asking students, why did you join the Open University? And we put them all together on this Likert scale. So, on this graph, you can see the motivation statements we presented the students with in the survey. 
um, the statements at the bottom were the ones that students agreed the most with and had the highest impact on their decision to join. As you can see, this mainly involved flexibility, financial reasons, such as having a job alongside or saving money on expenses and gaining work experience. Uh, but another important motivation was related to demonstrated self-motivation, which later on students explain how important it was to show that to employers. Um, what was interesting is that only a small percentage joined due to not having an entry qualification for a big university, which, as I might have probably mentioned earlier, the Open University is an open entry institution, so you don't need the um, A-levels um, that we have in the UK to enter the university. The following tables present the areas of student satisfaction uh, and later on the areas that students suggested need improvement. Um, the areas in this slide are ordered starting from the area that students were more satisfied with. So one of the primary areas where students, where students found satisfaction well, was the core structure. They appreciated the organization of the course material into weeks or blocks, which allowed for effective time management and the flexibility to fit their studies around work schedules. The clear expectations, checkboxes, and deadlines provided a sense of guidance and accountability. Moreover, the gradation of difficulty within the course and the user-friendly VLE virtual learning environment contributed to a positive learning experience. Students also expressed high levels of satisfaction with the support they received. The support was the support from tutors was particularly appreciated and it was described as really good. Um, access to plentiful and accessible resources, including mental health support and student bodies, further contributed to the feeling of being well supported. Also, frequent communication from university services ensured that students were kept informed and connected throughout their academic journey. Uh, this comprehensive support system was very important in having a positive experience for uh, newcomers at the university. Then the course content itself was another area where students found satisfaction. They welcomed the pay start to the course, which prevented feeling overwhelmed early on. Optional and recorded tutorials with flexible time options accommodated various schedules and learning styles. The content presented in multiple formats was easy to understand and it was engaging. The workload was balanced and students appreciated the access to study skills sections to enhance their learning. Some even noted that the course content overlapped with their prior experience um, and what we have in the UK, the A-levels, which is mainly the end exams of uh, students' secondary education which provided a sense of familiarity and confidence. I also have some quotes here. I hope you have the time to have a look at those, but this is what students actually wrote down when responding to the survey. Um, so continuing with the areas of satisfaction, the induction process, which as we saw in literature is quite important when it comes to onboarding distance learning students, uh, was proved to be a significant factor as well in student satisfaction. Students found the provided induction activities immensely helpful in, fac in, fac in facilitating their transition into university life. These activities included induction tutorials, freshers events, study planning advice, introduction forums, and even an Open Learn course. Open Learn is the platform that we have at the Open University, and we uh, freely shared 
snapshots from all the courses we have at the university. And we also create short courses for skills or for any other gap that we think we have to cover at the Open University. So we do have an open learn course, which is called How to Be an OU Student. And this shows students um, what they will be doing in their studies and what they have to improve, what they have to know. So that was one of the things that familiarized them with studying at a distance and they appreciate it. The assessment process was another area where students found satisfaction. Um, assessment is always a tricky um, thing to satisfy students on. They appreciated the clarity and detail in the instructions provided for assessments, ensuring they knew, they knew exactly what was expected of them. Uh, detailed feedback on results helped students track their progress and make improvements. Access to assessment templates and booklets, self-assessment quizzes, assignments matching course content, and regular assessments all contributed to a sense of preparedness and understanding. The absence of stressful competition and the availability of pilot assignments further eased the assessment progress process. Um, and finally, another area of satisfaction, which as you can see, is the one that students were the least satisfied with, um, was interaction. Um, in generally, they liked interaction with peers, tutors, and university organized events, and they thought that uh, it was something that helped them with their transition. They expressed satisfaction with the access to discussion forums, which allowed them to connect with others going through similar experiences. Um, they appreciated frequent communication with tutors, participation in small group tutor groups, involvement in the student hub live series of events, which is something that mainly students organize. All of this contributed to a sense of community and support. Also, communication via the OU community enhanced the overall learning experience. So in this and the following slide, I will present the area students suggested improving. And these are ordered, again, starting from the area that needs the most improvement. Uh, which, as you will notice, is also the area that students were less satisfied with. So uh, students have expressed a strong desire for enhancing interactions with their peers. They have suggested various ways to achieve this, including more meetups and face-to-face -face meetings to create opportunities for in-person connections, which, as you can understand, is quite difficult because we have students not only from across the UK, but also from across the world. Uh, students also emphasize the need for events to be more visible, ensuring that they are aware of them and they can participate uh, when they can. Also, many students sought specialized meetings for those uh, of the same age, shared interest or geographic locations, which can facilitate more meaningful connections between them. Um, additionally, students recommended improvements to the forum structure and the addition of features that promote greater course interaction. And just to remind you that we are getting younger and younger students joining us and the technologies and the social technologies keep changing. So students cannot find the forums as interesting as students back in the 90s and 2000s. They even proposed the use of WhatsApp groups for more direct and immediate communication. Um, the second area was about improving some tutor support and communication. Um, so students desired more personalized support and more frequent communication with their tutors. As you can see, they use the word more and more. So they think that we already have this in place, but they would like to have more of it. Um, they highlighted the importance of tutors initiating more check-ins with students, especially the younger students who might find it intimidating to reach out 
uh, themselves. Uh, building pre-existing relationships and making support more proactive were significant concerns in general for these students. And um, they saw these improvements as way as a way to enhance their academic experience and their overall sense of comfort with studying in distance. Suggestions for improvements in the area of assessment were also prevalent. Um, as you can see again, we have things in place, but they still wanted more of them. So students recommended the inclusion of more practice questions and assignment examples, which could aid their preparation and understanding of assessment expectations. They called for more explicit instructions and detailed feedback to provide greater clarity and guidance throughout the assessment process. Uh, students also suggested having more time between assignments, recognizing the value of having breathing space between tasks. Additionally, they expressed the need for access to more detailed marking criteria to enhance their comprehension of how assignments are evaluated. Uh, continuing with the areas of suggested improvement, um, Students believe the induction and support can be enhanced. They suggest personalized inductions conducted by their tutors, which can provide a more tailored and individualized start to their academic journey compared to the generic inductions. They also advocate for organized student introductions, which could, re which, uh, could create opportunities for students to connect and form social bonds early at the start of their journey, their study journey. Additionally, students express the need for more information about how tutorials work and additional course introduction materials to prepare them better uh, at the start or even before they start their modules. Um, there is a, a desire as well for more opportunities for training in academic writing and time management to build essential skills. Just to remind that we may have students who come straight from school and they may not uh, have had training on these skills. But also we, we have students who may have been away from education for the last 5, 10, 20 years. So it's important to refresh these skills and help them to uh, resume their educational journey. Uh, better signposting for resources and expectations was another point of focus. And finally, students suggested um, more financial and administratively oriented improvements, such as better access to funding aid, careers advice, and support for organizing uh, full-time studies. Um, students highlighted the need for improvements in the area of tutorials as well. Um, so again, it's what we have, but they wanted it more enhanced or more overall. So they seek to have more tutorials, including compulsory sessions and question and answer tutorials, which can offer a more structured and comprehensive learning experience. Um, compulsory sessions mainly came from students that they were feeling that having a, an increased sense of belonging is very important. And they were feeling that not many students were joining uh, the tutorial, so they wanted to have a bigger group of students to interact with. Um, students also advocate for longer tutorials or those uh, with more flexible time options to accommodate different schedules and learning preferences. They express a desire for, for assisted hours with tutors, which we, all, we already have on demand. Uh, but they would like to have them more and more organized to ensure that they have access to necessary guidance. Additionally, students recommend access to tutorials from other courses that they are not currently enrolled in, which can provide a broader perspective and additional learning opportunities. Um, students indicate an interest in refining the course content and structure, but that's only like a 5%, very minimum. 
So they emphasize the need for more visual content and variety to make the learning experience more engaging. Smaller blocks of learning are also suggested to improve the organization of course material and make it more digestible. And finally, we had a, a few comments that were very focused on younger student experience. Um, and it's about bringing attention to the needs of bringing content resources and support more tailored to that age group. So they advocate for creation of social media groups, forum groups that cater for younger students. And additionally, they express the desire for skill courses and resources that are designed to meet the needs of their age group. Uh, some students find that existing course content and skills instructions may be more suited to older students or those with more life experience as well. Uh, so to wrap up, some reflections on the overall study. Um, many students make an active choice to study through distance learning rather than simply opting for it due to an open entry policy. Uh, this deliberate choice stems from a range of motivation and needs, and understanding this active choice is crucial for institutions to provide the right support and meet the expectations of these learners. Uh, the motivations behind this active choice are multiple. Flexibility remains a private motivator as distance learning allows students to balance their studies with work, family, and personal commitments. Financial considerations often play a significant role as well as distance learning can be a more cost-effective option. Additionally, students appreciate the opportunity to gain work experience simultaneously with their studies. Institutions then should focus on providing robust support to decision makers in recruiting and onboarding distance learners. Uh, this support can involve some elements such as um, debunking myths and, and misconceptions about distance learning. Prospective students should understand that distance learning programs are supported by a tutor and the community and is not a plain online learning course. Um, when promoting distance learning, institutions should also emphasize the development of real life skills that they are highly relevant in today's job market. This includes skills like time management, self-regulation and the ability to balance work life and study effectively. And as the world becomes increasingly digital, institutions should highlight the development of digital skills as a key benefit of distance learning. Uh, this aligns with the demands of the modern workplace and demonstrates the practical applicability of distance learning. Also, prospective students with part-time jobs may choose distance learning to maintain employment while pursuing a degree. Uh, again, institutions should underscore the flexibility of distance learning as a perfect fit for individuals with job commitments. Uh, some other reflections focus on the design of level one courses which plays a pivotal role in creating a positive learning experience. Well-structured courses with a slow start help students ease into their studies and supports self-regulation. Recognizing and continuing these good practices is essential for fostering a conducive learning environment. Also, interaction is a crucial aspect of learning, and institutions should focus on strengthening connections among students and between students and their tutors. Building a sense of community in the virtual classroom can significantly enhance the learning experience. Emphasizing the social elements of learning encourages collaboration, peer support, and the more engaging educational journey. And finally, to further enhance the learning experience, institutions should offer additional study-related support before and during the course. This includes resources and guidance on academic writing, study skills, and other essential competences. Overall, equipping students with these skills will ensure that they can excel in their coursework, achieve academic success, and for sure have a better learning experience with your institution. So thank you very much. Um, I have added this slide, which shows where about you can find this work. Um, we have to publish papers on those and a list of references. So thank you very much. Kamran, back to you, I think. 
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Maria, uh, for very interesting and very insightful research like outputs. And uh, I'm sure these, these research outputs are very helpful for all the listeners and participants because all of us are from open and distance learning. And these recommendations are very much helpful for all the context, uh, even though there's a lot of diversity in this world, but still uh, there are a lot of common problems which all the open universities are facing. So thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, once again, uh, before uh, proceeding to our next speaker, uh, let me remind you uh, the regulations of this webinar for the newcomers or the previous one, because uh, all the participants might have a lot of questions uh, after listening to your uh, presentation. So let me focus, uh, reread again the webinar regulations. So. If you are having any question, so you can uh, ask the question in the chat box. And whenever you are sending a question, so write your name, write your institution, and you can also mention the professor uh, or the speaker whom you want to address the question. Number two, question uh, will be first read by the moderator once it is displayed on the screen and the speakers may answer the uh, question accordingly. Number three, very important uh, regulation. If you want to get the certificate, you have to fill out the registration form in advance. If you have, if you have not filled, just fill it and follow the whole program. After the program, we will share the feedback form link. And uh, through that link, you, will, uh, you can get later on the certificate as well. Now proceeding to our very interesting, very famous professor, Santi, Professor Santi Raghavan. Let me briefly introduce to Professor Santi. Professor Santi, she is the Vice President, Deputy Vice Chancellor at Open University of Malaysia, possessing expertise in diverse range of academic areas from open and distance learning to business studies, training management, organizational management, and human capital development. And she has made outstanding contributions in these fields and played a pivotal role in shaping the academic landscape of OUM. She has distinguished career at OUM and began in 2001 as a tutor. And notably, she served as vice dean of the Faculty of Business and Management and held key positions in various departments, expanding OUM's global reach by facilitating programs for international institutions. Professor Santi has authored more than 24 books and over 80 articles on educational topics. Her expertise was internationally recognized with awards such as Italian Government Award and the Asian Association of Open Universities Inter-University Staff Exchange Fellowship. With her PhD in training management, she leads research teams in the technology and education strategies, securing grants from the organizations like UNESCO and the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Communication. She is also actively contributing to the various educational and social initiatives, demonstrating her commitment to making a positive impact. So let us welcome Professor Dr. Santi Raghwan. So um, just to remind you, you have 30 minutes. Uh, so floor is to you, Professor Santi. Thank you, Kamran. Am I coming loud and clear? Yes, you are uh, audible. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, can I have the secretariat uh, flash my screen? My PowerPoint slides, please. Uh, as the secretary is uh, finding yeah, sure. the slides, uh, probably I will just share um, some information about Open University Malaysia. Uh, as how uh, Dr. Maria has explained uh, about OU UK, uh, I do not have a slide on OUM, but let me just share um, some information about. Open University Malaysia. We started with just above 700 students in 2001. And right now we have about 30,000 uh, active learners. We have an alumni of 103,000 uh, students. We have diploma programs, bachelor, postgraduate diploma, masters up to PhDs. We have 35 learning centers all over Malaysia, and we have 15 learning centers um, overseas. Um, we have 55 programs, and I am very proud to say that we also serve the prisoners, and we have 78 
Prisoners Learners with OUM. We started the program in 2008 and we have had several graduating um, from OUM, uh, from diploma, and we are hoping that um, perhaps by next year, we would successfully have a PhD graduate from the Malaysian prison. He is currently preparing himself for his viva. I am one of his examiners. So that's about Open University Malaysia. And um, uh, the topic, optimizing students' learning experiences in OFDL. I'm glad I am the second speaker because what I am about to present to you is actually the lead on to what Dr. Maria presented just now from her slide 10 onwards, which were areas on suggested improvement. So if you look at my slides, they're basically the answers for her areas of suggested improvements. So can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Now, although the uh, title says uh, opti optimizing, I went for maximizing. So effective customer service for maximum students' learning experience. Next, please. Now, this is how I divided the kind of learners, the type of learners that we have in Open University Malaysia. And each category of learner has a different type of treatment or initiatives that are prepared for each and every one of them. So if you look at the categories, yes, we have the new learners. Uh, when we first started in 2001, the landscape of students were very much different from what we are facing right now. Back then, our learners were from the age of maybe 30, early 30s, right up to the age of 55, even 60. But right now, we have kids straight from school wanting to enroll themselves in open universities, open university Malaysia, as young as 18 year olds. And we also found out, well, back then, um, OUM was perhaps a university for those who may have missed learning in a higher education back then. They, you know, when OUM came about, uh, we had adult learners because they seemed to be the ones that had to go to work to, to, to make money for the families. And when we came around, they enrolled in OUM because they finally were ready to get themselves a degree or a diploma. But right now, what we are experiencing, we are having extremely good students with 10 A pluses in their O levels and five principals in their A levels wanting to join Open University Malaysia. And when I called some of them to find out why are you guys interested in Open University Malaysia? I mean, I mean, you, you have to just apply and you'd be going to Ivy League universities in any part of the world. And they say, no, Prof, we want to work and we want to study at the same time. They wanted to make money. So we have these categories of new learners. Then we have this category of active learners who pay their fees and are active every semester. We also have inactive students whereby they do not register the semester after. They register this semester. Okay, they, they are inactive because they are uh, not paying their fees in the coming semester. And somehow after two or three semesters, they come back again. And then we have the at-risk students. Those doing the bachelor's degree, they are at risk because their CGPA is below 2.0 and they may not be graduating at all. And for the postgraduate, CGPA below 3.0 will not allow them to graduate. So we have those students that we have to cater for as well. 
Then we have the students who differ. They differ because they have, um, you know, um, issues with their health. They go on a world tour. They have a posting in a different country. So they apply for deferment. Then we have the dormant students. Dormant students are those who do not pay their fees for three consecutive semesters. And then in the fourth semester, we put them in the dormant group. And yes, we have the quitting students who we contact them even after they quit, persuading them to join us back again. And we have students who graduated and we also do take care of students who pass away. When students pass away, we have special allocations for them that we deliver to the spouses or the family of those who have dearly departed. Next slide, please. Yes. Now, these are what we promise to our students that we will deliver. We deliver modules. We make sure our tutorials are on time. We make sure our tutors and facilitators are effective and efficient. We make sure that our learning management system is up and running. We, we make sure our digital library is offering them the best search engines and, and ebooks, and we provide them all sorts of support services that I will share with you now. Next slide, please. So we our student support services are not intact just only to attract learners but they are also to retain learners. I will show you a graph later on and you would know what I'm, I'm actually trying to say. Yeah? Uh, next slide. Yes. Now, if you can just look at the slide and, and, and just... Um, Share with me whether you do these at your universities because we have been doing this from day one. Now, these are the support services for students' retention. Every student that walks into OUM, they have these support services ready for them. Now, first and foremost, for the new learners, we have workshops that we call learning skills workshops. Now, some students come to OUM after leaving school 20 years or 30 years. So we have to help them to teach them how to learn again, how to take notes again, how to read, how to skim and scan. So all these are taught at the learning skills workshop. Yes, when we started, it was a face-to-face. -face, and then during COVID, it went fully online. And at this point in time, we offer learning skills workshop both via Google Meet as well as face-to-face. -face. As I said earlier, we have 35 learning centers and learners can opt to go to these learning centers and attend the learning skills workshop or if they are unable to, to go physically, then they can follow us in the Google Meet where we run the learning skill workshops as well. And this is conducted every semester. We have three semesters in a year in OUM. Now, apart from the learning skills workshop, the other workshops that we conduct are assignment writing. As I said just now, adult learners, they sometimes or they, they do not know how to write an assignment. So we have tutors and academics from the faculties assisting our learners how to attempt writing the assignments. Now, apart from assignment writing, for the postgraduate learners, especially the master's students, they have project paper writing workshops as well. How to write their chapter one, how to uh, tackle chapter two, what is chapter three all about? 
How do I do the analysis in chapter four? And what do I say as my concluding remarks in chapter five? So these are also held for our learners. Now, apart from these workshops, we have the examination clinics right before the final examination. We have face-to-face -face academic advising by the learning center directors. Now, these are for the new learners, but starting from last semester, we have also started doing this for the semester two and semester three learners as well. Face-to-face -face academic advising by the learning center directors, as well as the uh, academics from the faculties. Now, we also have the e-counseling. These are specifically for students who are at risk of not graduating with a CGP of below 2.0 and below 3.0. We conduct dialogue sessions with learners all the time. We put them in our calendars and we conduct this at our 35 learning centers, perhaps a few in the first semester and the others would have their dialogue sessions in the second and the third semester. Now, apart from these workshops, we also have the electronic customer relationship management. This is an online platform for learners to go on board and inquire about anything that they wish to know, to suggest something to OUM, to complain perhaps about their tutors or their timing, the tutorials or the library, just about anything, or to compliment us when we do something good. So apart from ECRM, we also have the call center. We have staffs calling our inactive students and dormant students to return back to us. We have a welfare unit to take care of students who face difficulties in terms of um, uh, cash, not being able to pay for their fees, or if they have had accidents, we purchase wheelchairs for them, or if there, if there is a death, then we contact the family and we offer our services to them. So there we have a welfare unit in uh, the, um, the um, learner affairs uh, unit to take care of welfare as well. Then we have the academic advising by faculties. We do this uh, every semester. We also have sports and activities by zones. There are six zones in Malaysia. So... Uh, we, you have provinces, we have zones. So we also conduct sports and other activities for our learners. We have OUM Facebook. We have Learner Centers, OUM Facebook. We also have for uh, subjects, uh, Facebook as well. Now, apart from these, we have the print-based, the web-based learning material, uh, just like uh, most of the open universities. We have modules. We are moving into H5P modules, the interactive modules now. We also have translated modules. Now, in Malaysia, we have many races. We have uh, the Malays, the Chinese, the Indians. We have the Kadazans, the Bajaus. Now, some of our modules have been translated into other languages as well. Uh, basically, this is done on demand. We don't do it all, this, all the time. But do we do this based on demand as well. We also have modules for the, uh, the disadvantaged group, the people with uh, disabilities as well. Now, we also have the eye lectures, the eye tutorials, the eye radio, and many others uh, supporting uh, the, the, the students for their uh, learning uh, pathway. We have resource centers. We have the mathematics resource center. We have English resource center, we have the OER, we also have SMS services to remind students that, uh, you know, um, the deadline is up for submission of assignments, uh, final exam is coming up in two weeks time. We send SMSs also to uh, offer our greetings of uh, the seasonal greetings like Merry Christmas or uh, Idil Adha, Idil Fitri and so on, and even for New Year's. Next slide, please. Now, the first point of contact. Should a learner need assistance? 
he needs support. Now, the first contact person should be the program director. So if the student enters OUM website, he or she would be able to know who the program director is or who the program coordinator is. And this is the first point of contact the student should have. And in our learning skills workshop, we introduce our program directors to them. So for example, we have this person here. He's a program director for one of the programs in OUM. Next slide, please. Now, these are the support channels. I spoke about the ECRM just now, the Electronic Customer Relationship Management. Now, this is home built. I built this in 2000, uh, perhaps 10. I'm not so sure about it. 2009, maybe. This is home built. It was built simply to gather any questions from the students. You see, we work nine to five. Students may have a question at 10 p.m. or 12 midnight. And we didn't want to ignore uh, these queries from students. Hence, we built eCRM and students can inquire, they can complain, they can suggest, they can compliment. And if they require counseling, they can also go to eCRM and get the proper assistance. We have the live chat. I will share with you some some uh, data on it. We have telephone and WhatsApp uh, to the learning centers. We also have counselors for academic uh, advising as well as counseling services, uh, as well as for career guidance as well. Um, the next slide, please. So this is the ECRM. I will not go through it, but it's very simple. And um, it's very easy for students to, to just enter and, and there's a pull-down menu. They just pull it down, choose what they want to say, and, and there it is. Okay, next slide, please. Next. We, we have liaison officers to tackle each and every one of the tickets that comes into the ECRM, okay? Uh, next, please. Next slide. Okay, so we are done with ECRM. Now, these are the live chats. Now, before a student has any inquiry, he, may, he or she may be able to, to go through the FAQs uh, in the live chat before he or she would like to put up a question. So this is our live chat. Uh, it's open from nine to four. We have agents uh, manning the station. Uh, next slide. Okay, I mentioned just now that we have 35 learning centers. This is another support channel that a learner can go to or if he or she faces uh, 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 problems, issues. For example, they may not have good, strong Wi-Fi from home. They can always go to the learning centers and access Wi-Fi from there. So apart from Wi-Fi, they can go over to the learning centers to meet up with the directors, to speak to them and uh, channel their grouses or get any sort of uh, support they may need from the learning centers. Each learning center is manned about four to five staffs, depending on how big uh, the learning center is. Next slide, please. These are all the addresses and telephone numbers of our 35 learning centers. Next, please. And this is the counselor. So the counselor is there for academic advising. Sometimes students have simple problems like they don't know how to manage their time. They come back home after work. They have three assignments to complete. They don't know how to start, where to start. So the counsellor comes into the picture uh, where she is able to provide uh, academic counselling. Sometimes they even go through breakups in the family, husbands not wanting their wives to further their studies wives not wanting their husbands 
to further their studies. You know, we, we have all these problems. Employers not wanting employees to further studies. Uh, we have we we have gone through so much of issues with our students when they come forward with problems they face at the workplace as as well as the home front. So the counselor is ever ready to 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 assist uh, the learners either through face to face or online. And her service hours are as how it's written on the bottom corner on the right hand side. Next slide, please. Now, financial support. The first one, the PTPT and study loan, this is arranged by the government. But we as Open University Malaysia, we, we work as a one-stop center where the students can apply for these government loans through Open University Malaysia. So we, we, we do uh, cater for students' need if they are, um, in case they are eligible, for study loans from the government and so on. Now, we also have the Employee Provident uh, Fund, Withdrawal. Um, OUM also assists students to communicate applications to uh, the Employee Provident Fund for withdrawals. Now, other than that, we also assist for personal loans from commercial banks. We also offer rebates and discounts for students who are in need. We also have flexible payment. We introduced this, I think, in 2008, where students can pay their fees in installments. And Dharma Siswa is actually scholarship. We have the Chancellor's um, uh, Fund, where we offer scholarship for students who are financially tight, but they are uh, outstanding students in their programs. Next, please. Right. Now, <clears throat> we have 30,000 active students. Some students go online with us. Some students come over to the learning centers and the headquarters if they face any issues. Now, I, I, I'm, for years, I have been advising our staffs that interpersonal skills are very important when you're tackling adult learners. So these few slides are basically how to engage with customers through effective interpersonal skills. Uh, can we see the next slide, please? Now, I'm one of the trainers for new recruits in OUM. Now, I always emphasize on creating a positive impression from grooming especially when you are attending to a learner. Self-grooming is very important. The proper attire, the, pro the proper shoe wear, the proper sp speech are essential for creating a positive impression. So this goes for all new recruits in OUM, all new employees in OUM is taught how to create a positive impression because we want to show a corporate image to our learners. Next slide, please. I'm looking at time. I will keep to time. Now, effective customer service starts with never ever making promises that you cannot keep. I always tell my staffs who men learners, don't make promises if you can't keep them. That's always rule number one. And number two, listen to your customers. What is it that they're trying to tell you? Listen to them. And number three, deal with complaints quickly. If you receive the complaint now, try to solve the complaint now. If you can't because you have to deal with the finance department or you have to deal with the graduate center, then you have to deal with it within three working days. Now, these are some of the deadlines that we set for our agents so that they are able to deal with complaints quickly. Number four, be helpful, be courteous at all times and be knowledgeable about the products, about the programs. We have 55 programs and about 600 courses being taught in OUM at one time. So 
We want our agents to be knowledgeable on all our products. Number five, respecting the customer. We always ask our, our agents, our staffs to use salutation. Sir, madam, in Malaysia, it's inche or che or puan. So these are some of the terms that we use to show respect to our customers. Number six, taking the extra step, never to pass the buck. Now, I always train my, my staffs. If you were the one who heard the, pro the problem for the first time, you took the matter, you heard it for the first time, then it is you who have to solve it for the student. The student wouldn't, want, wouldn't like to be passed around from one agent to the other, from one staff to the other. If you took the trouble, if you took the complaint, then you have to take the trouble to close the complaint. So that's number six. Take the extra step, never to pass the buck to someone else. And number seven, to empathize, to always put themselves in the shoes of the learner in trouble, to convince them that they understand what trouble the student is in and that they are there to help them out. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> next slide. When you work with adult learners, some of them can be very challenging. I'm sure all of us have experienced challenging customers every now and then. And I always tell my staffs, stay calm. If they are being difficult, then you don't have to be difficult too. Things are already bad on one side. Don't make it worse. So stay calm. Take it professionally. Listen. And let the customer vent. Let the student vent. Let the person say his grouses. You know, let him air whatever complaint he has. Just listen. Never argue. Never be defensive. Apologize if you feel that there has been a mistake done by some other uh, staffs or by you or or. Or, or the organization itself. Apologize. Nothing wrong in apologizing. Focus on solving the problem. And this is the most important part. Mutually agree on the solution. Now, if the staff has a solution for the learner, the learner obviously has to agree on the solution provided by the agent. And another important thing is to follow up. After one or two days, we encourage our, our staffs to call up the learner and ask if everything is all right, if everything is fine now. So follow up. Next, please. So, the, so when it comes to handling difficult customers, four steps, listen, identify the problem, avoid the blame game, never blame anyone, and resolve the problem. Next, please. Now, handling difficult customers, um, our, student, our students' age range from 17 years old up to 90 years old. Now, that's the range that we have. Sometimes we have students, international students, who don't complain, but the spouses call and complain on behalf of the student. So how to handle difficult customers? Eight strategies, never take it personally. And number two, I always tell my staff, guys, you are good at your job. Never lose your cool. So remember, you're the best. You're the best in your job. Give your best. Number three, write down their complaint. The minute the student realizes that you're jotting down the complaint, half the problem is solved because they know that someone is actually listening to the matter or the issue or the complaint. And number four, if you are not able to solve the problem and you see that your customer, your student keeps on complaining on and on and on, it's always good to bring in another person, a supervisor into the conversation so that he or she may be able to assist, to provide probably a different um, uh, view or perspective to help the student out. 
Next, please. Number five. Yes. The staff himself or herself has got to learn how to manage their own stress level. And number six, debrief the situation when someone with someone else when the customer leaves. Now, when the student has ended his complaint, it's always good to talk to another staff about it because sometimes you just get a different perspective, a different outlook on the same problem. Number seven, to recognize and accept that you will work with customers who have had bad days. So this is something that, you know, the staff has got to absorb, to know. Number eight, consider what you would do on a different day if the same sort of complaints come again. So consider how you could do this differently next time. Next, please. Now, these are telephone skills that I will not go through. My slides will be with the secretary. In case you want, you can download them. Can I go to the next slide, please? This is about telephone skills. We get a lot of telephone calls. And that is why I said in the first um, bullet, every call counts. So it's very important for us to take our calls properly because clients could be interested to study and we don't want to put them off. And these could be clients who are customers or students who are having issues or problems uh, for us to solve it for them, yeah? Okay, next slide. And the next slide, oh, uh, just hold on. If I would kindly bring you to the second bullet. Now, a typical person, if he has had a, a negative experience, he will bring this to 50 others via through, via through Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or whatever, the social media. He speaks to 50 others if he has had a bad experience with you. But a satisfied customer only speaks to about 5 to 10 or even lesser. Yeah, right. Next, please. And next, next, it's almost 4.30, so I, next slide, next please, right, now with all the activities that I have mentioned just now, now, this is the graph that I like to share with you. Now, if you look at the retention rate for new students, in the year 2022, with all the activities that we laid out for our new learners, this was the retention rate. But in 2023, with more number of activities for the new learners, we have, I would say, successfully have a better retention rate for new new learners, new students, from, from 71 to 77.1. So probably uh, we're not too happy about the retention rate though, but the graph indicates that more and more students are being retained through the activities that are being implemented in Open University Malaysia. Next slide, please. So what you saw just now was for the new learners. What is shown here is the retention rate for senior learners. So in the year 2022, these are the returning students. These are, these are the students who do not re-register. You know, they come for the first semester, they don't re-register for the second. Or they come for the second semester and they don't re-register for their third or their fourth semester. So we do all these kinds of activities for them. We hope that they will return back to us. And if you look at the graph, for the year 2022, we had 6,062 students returning to OUM by re-registering themselves for the consecutive semester. And for 2023, I'm very happy to say we haven't 
announced this to the top management in OUM. You're the first to see the slide. This will be presented tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. But I'm sharing this with you. 7,486 students have returned to OUM. Senior students returning to OUM. Otherwise, they would not have re-registered with OUM. Next slide, please. Now, <clears throat> you may want to know how many staffs I have who are working on the ECRM, answering the emails, the live chats, the ones helping with the employee provident fund, counselings and so on. I only have one counsellor. And these are the agents that I have who tackle each and every one's um, query into OUM. Na. And if you look at the extreme right, you, look, you can see the total tickets up to last week. Sorry, up to 20th October, um, five days ago. These are the total tickets that we have tackled. 39,000 ECRM tickets. 9,640 emails, 1,114 live chats, 19,000 inquiries on Employee Provident Fund, and 224 counselling sessions. Next slide, please. Now, these are the activities implemented. We have calling sessions. We actually call our learners. Those who do not register, those who quit, those who do not complete their first time login, the new learners who do not know how to log in into the system, we send them personalized reminder through our emails. We are enhancing one of our systems called the smart one. And we also have the auto defer and the auto quit process, uh, whereby when the students, we feel that, you know, four semesters, they did not re-register, we actually help them to quit. We call that the auto-quit or we auto-defer for our learners. This is something that we will be starting in January 2024. And surveys, yes, we run surveys. We run learner satisfaction survey. We run new learner satisfaction survey. And the last one, the tracer study, now this is conducted by the Malaysian uh, Higher Learning uh, Ministry. We have a ministry dedicated for uh, higher education. That ministry takes care of the third survey, the tracer study on, on graduates. And the last slide. So for my staff, what do I do? I We have a balanced scorecard for their KPI and their PMS. We have a balanced scorecard where they have to show proof of efficient and fast handling of customer complaints. The three working days I, I said just now, how they engage themselves with learners, how they enhance their capabilities in retention and attrition, how they utilize their budget for programs and the other initiatives as well. Next, please. Thank you. And I can take questions now. Thank you so much. 30 minutes. I'm glad Thank you very I much. did it within yeah. time. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Santi, uh, for very Thank interesting you, and very, uh, uh, like, uh, in detail, you have provided uh, the ground realities. And uh, now we have audience and all of us have, uh, the pers we have got the perspective from both sides, like one, the European side as well, and from the Asian side as well. And uh, now, now we will move to the, interesting part of our session because uh, without interactivity our session is not complete so coming to the question and answer session so let us have the questions i think a lot of uh, participants have already asked so i will be waiting for the screen Yeah, we have a technical problem. Okay. 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 Yeah, I've seen. Okay, the first question is from uh, Professor 
Dr. Ajmal. He is from uh, Alama Gwalap University from SCM University. So his question is from Dr. Maria. Uh, and his question is, like we are using blended learning approach. Can you suggest any safe method of assessment of students through online method? <clears throat> Yes, Dr. Um, Maria. Thank you, Kamran. Yeah, this is this is a very tricky question that takes a very complex answer, and it's currently being investigated across the world. So, because I also worked on this research topic, um, I think that the main solution at the moment, the main solutions at the moment, are two for online exams. Um, the first solution would be to have proctored exams. But that brings loads of other issues on your plate because you have to be careful about the proctoring methods you will be using so that you are not intervening your students' privacy. And it's good to have a survey and see what kind of privacy approaches will not be welcomed by your students students slash clients because if they are not happy, they may not resume their studies as well. Um, but also proctoring exams mean that you will have to get your get amend um, by develop your own proctoring software. So, is someone trying to? No, no, go ahead, please, go ahead. Okay, so that, that means that because um, the, the proctoring softwares have to be usable also for your disabled students. So again, you have to go through your student needs and understand what kind of issues you have to solve on the way before you even launch the, the software the software. Uh, that will be giving the proctoring online exams. So one method is proctoring. The second method, which uh, might be less costly, but there is more work to do, is to rethink the assessment. You can go for open book online remote exams, but you have to uh, start de designing uh, authentic assessment because as you all know it's also the era of generative artificial intelligence so if you just launch open uh, book exams it is very likely that many of your students will be cheating and then their qualification will have no value and the employers will not be happy uh, to uh, employ them so uh, if if you're not going to proctor your students so you're not going to pay for a good software, a costly software. The other option is to change the assessment so that it's authentic. It's focusing on students' experiences. It has to be personal. It has to be something that the AI cannot give an easy, easy solution or obvious solution to. So these are the two things that are currently playing um in the domain I, I hope my answer is helpful i know it's not an easier answer but these are the current answers yeah thank you very much uh, you are very right like because of yeah. I can add yeah, yeah. can i add yeah please on? yeah please go ahead go ahead thank you um apart from um proctoring uh, that has been explained by dr maria just now uh in oum we also have the uh, question bank we do online exams allowed by the government. Now, um, when COVID came, um, most of the traditional conventional universities had issues about um, having their classes online and so on. But OUN, we just carried on with our classes and our examination, and we conducted our exams online. Uh, questions are in the question bank. Uh, we have thousands of questions in our questions bank, question bank uh, developed by the academicians, the course leaders for the particular subject. And questions are generated based on the um, learning outcomes expected from each of, uh, each of the topic. And on a particular day, um, 
the the students are allowed to sit for their examinations online. So if the exam is for two hours, then from, let's say, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., the student sits in front of his laptop and the questions are downloaded and answered within the two hours and uploaded. And we need to have a camera because we don't want the student to have assistance helping him or out. So, Associate Professor Chaudhry, if you'd like to know more, you can contact me and um, we can share with you what we do in OUM uh, pertaining to online examination. We have been doing this for the past three years now, successfully. And the Malaysian Qualification Agency um, has approved it. In fact, encouraging other universities to follow mm -hmm. us. Thank you, Professor Santi, for the additions. J just to mention that this is proctored exams because you're using a camera to monitor the students. And it might work in some institutions and countries, but you know, in the West, we are a bit more cautious about privacy. So that that's, you know, it's not coming without any complaints or pressure yes. or anything else. So agree, agree. You you know your students, you know how the culture in your country and the institution is. So I, I suppose you will be able to make the right decisions for your institution. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, you very rightly mentioned, like because um, this is the uh, like main difference in West and Asian countries. I guess uh, we have less lesser problem. We have the problem of privacy, but as uh, not like in the Europe. And so we have to see which is the most uh, authentic and the balanced approach to uh, to manage this proctoring by using the AI and by using some manual thing as well. So thank you very much. Uh, coming to our next question. So if there is any any other question here. Okay, this question is from Marisa and to both of our like uh, professors. And Marisa is from Terbuka University of Indonesia. Question is, with a large number of students, do OUM and Open University have any experience in responding to problems asked by the students via the contact center? If yes, what solution was implemented? I think first, Dr. Maria, please. Um, so I was I was watching Professor Santi's presentation and we have similar systems. However, when it comes to educational related issues, we have a different system where the students go through uh, their tutors and their staff tutors. So each student has their tutor and each tutor has a staff tutor that is um, connected to the module course chair. Um, so if it's something that is re learning related, they can go straight to their tutors. Each, each tutor has 20 students, so they will never be overwhelmed with just 20 mm -hmm. students. If it's a more administrative issue, then they can go, they can be referred to the student um, uh, SST, student support services. Um, and the student support services, they will just send them to the right department. So it's not very centralized. We don't have only one department answering all the questions, but we have one department that will send, they will send you to the right person. And that's easily accessible. It's on the students page. So, and there are buttons like, I want to do this. I want to do that. So you just click, click the button and that service connects you to the right service. So in that way, not one service or one person has to answer all responses. It just goes to the right person. But this is from the Open University, which is quite large. So we can afford having like specialized people specializing on one specific topic when it comes to support. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Santi, please, if you can add yeah, your context. Uh, Marisa, uh, exactly. As how uh, Dr. Maria has uh, explained just now, uh, I was in similar. Uh, the students inquire through the eCRM, the Electronic Customer Relationship Management, manned by several of my staffs. Uh, if the question is about um, 
uh, academic uh, assistant, then it goes to the faculty. We have liaison persons at the faculty who's supposed to answer administrative questions or academic questions. Now, likewise, every department, we have an LO, a liaison officer. So the, the questions must be answered within three working days. Hence, whatever questions that comes through ECRM, it is quickly sent over to the liaison persons uh, of whichever department that is supposed to uh, assist in responding the, the queries. So far, we have no problems uh, answering, responding to questions that are coming in through the ECRM. In fact, when students go to the learning centers, we have 35 learning centers. When they go to the learning centers with their problems, and assuming that the learning centers are not able to assist because it has got something to do with the headquarters, they ask the students to go to ECRM as well. They help the student to log into the ECRM and they assist the student to upload it. And when we receive it, we answer it by sending it to the different liaison officers in the other departments. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Professor Santi and Dr. Mamaria for giving your like uh, opinion and context of different open universities. Coming to our, I think we have uh, five more minutes. We can also take another question if it is available. So we have a question from Dr. Rahmat uh, to Dr. Santi, Professor Santi. What are the most common problems students asked to the staff in average how long a staff allocate to one student coming for a consultation and does the student give feedback for the service he or she is receiving yes please dr santi okay thank you most common problems wow they have a whole bus load of problems <laughs> but if you ask what would be the most common problem would be number one how to write assignments uh, how to complete assignments. Uh, that would be probably the most common problems. Uh, Prof. Rahman, let me just share with you. Um, when students do not complete their assignments because they don't know how to complete their assignments or they do not know how to manage their time to complete their assignments, they do not submit. Now, these are the same students who do not submit they also do not sit for the final exams. And these are the same students who do not re-register themselves for the coming semesters. So we have among the new learners, almost 30%, 25 to 30% of new learners do not re-register to the second semester only for the reason they did not submit their assignment. So this, I would say, is the most common problem that the students are facing and also what the management is facing in OUM. So that's number one. What was question number two, please? I forgot. Can we see the question number two? Was it about time? What was question number two? Yes, it is average time. Um. Okay. Uh, in average, how long does a staff, just give me one minute, uh, allocate for one student? Oh, this, um, we have students who come for consultations on family matter, career matter, as well as on, uh, on, on their studies. Um, we don't allocate any specific hours, Prof. Um, sometimes it's ongoing. Uh, we have uh, consultation labs uh, in OUM. We just uh, carry on until we hope the student is able to uh, to uh, overcome his problem. Does the student give feedback? Oh, yes. For every uh, service given, we we ask the students to, to rate us uh, from one star to, to five stars. We actually have a rating system for all services. One star to five star. Thank you.
thank you very much uh, dr santi uh, i think we have do you have time to take another question or yeah we still have one one questions okay yeah okay we have a question from afifa uh, she is also from youtube indonesia her question is from dr maria how did any student ever experience academic burn academic burn with during distance learning like what do you say about academic burning in distance learning especially in context of uk open university hi afifa uh, thank you for your questions just also just also mention that i was trying to answer some of the questions on the chat because we don't have enough time um academic burnout yes it's quite common and not only distance learning but in distance learning you know it can be more extreme because you cannot see the student facing it and so our suggestion for students is first of all we have to be proactive we have to avoid <clears throat> we have to avoid having this situation coming so we started offering several things that can address this issue for example we ask them uh we facilitate having study buddies at the start of the course and most of the students have already said that having someone to always study with it makes them feeling less burned out because you know they are more motivated they have someone to share their experiences with so having a study buddy is very important and then we we try to focus on what kind of personal circumstances may be responsible for having an academic burnout and for example as we have many mature students child care was one of the things so we're trying to offer them some child care funds support funds that could help them dedicate an amount of time every day for their studies because apparently if you if you have a house full of kids a husband a wife if you work full time then it's so difficult and it it's getting overwhelmed so these are some proactive things that we're trying to do but then as i always as i mentioned earlier you can always talk with your tutor and they can offer you like different um Uh, different options for studying uh for example they can provide you with more simplified ways uh more simplified content to get you started which again this is something that we try to do before any burnout we are trying to get students study slowly slowly especially at the beginning so that they are getting used to how they are supposed to study before we start giving them more hard experiences um and then as professor santi said we have we call them academic advice advisors not counselors so if it's something that has to do with difficulties with academic stuff they can always go to their academic counselors and if it's something that has to do with their personal mental health issues we ha- we also have mental health counselors that they can join and they can help them um you know bring back all the motivations they had when they started the course and the final option for us is which we don't always you know want students to get there we tell them that they can always defer a course so they can keep their registration they can defer the course and they they can start again in the next presentation because they may be facing something that we cannot address by using all of the other methods i suggested so that would be the last option defer and then start again in the next course presentation without losing any money without losing any time so i, I hope i answered the question if i Thank can you very much. add on if i can just add on yeah go ahead yeah go ahead please everything that dr maria says yes 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 bena one way to show or to overcome burnout among students would be for you to show that you care pastoral care would really be helpful in bringing back learners to your institution we have had students who left their studies 3 4 even 5 to 6 years and we keep calling them back come back to oum let us help you with your journey and they come back 
after four years, after six years. Even last semester, we had students after eight years returning back to OUM just because we called. We called and we contacted them. We offered our assistance and they come back. So pastoral care, I would say, would be the, the recommendation, uh, if you can, to provide to your learners who may be facing burnout. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Dr. Maria and Dr. Santi. Uh, I think this uh, discussion both uh, were very fruitful, very informative discussion. And we saw different context of uh, UK Open University and the context of Open University of Malaysia. And despite like having a lot of technological things, disruptions having these days, especially of AI and uh, especially after COVID, everything went online. But still, I think Open Universities have uh, a big scale and we don't we, we cannot forget the ground realities because uh, in terms of ground realities we, it is not as simple like to just implement the ai and everything will be solved so there are a lot of problems and a lot of like challenges for open universities and different cultures have different problems so these discussions were very helpful for everyone i guess uh, to get an over, overall guidelines how to tackle the problem so we can streamline our education so with this, uh, I will again thanks to, to both the speakers and I will uh, hand over to the host for further proceeding. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kamran Mir. And then thank you very much for Dr. Maria and Professor Santi. It is, wow, a speechless. Very interesting. I discussed with, together with my friend here that... Uh, both of you are completing each other. <laughs> and then uh, thank you so much. Actually, for information that we still have uh, 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 around uh, five to seven more questions, but uh, due to time, uh, we cannot uh, set, uh, ask the questions to you. Uh, for, uh, or set, uh, for you, for the participants who would like to ask the questions, you can uh, open our YouTube channel, Ute TV, and uh, I will also share the link to uh, Dr. Maria and uh, Professor Santi, the link to the YouTube. So in case there is questions from our uh, participants, uh, you can uh, also answer the question on our YouTube. And uh, once again, it is very interesting. And then uh, I will share the recording of our set, uh, webinar to our colleagues here in Usa Sebuka because some of them are not watching and then also to the students because it is uh, very important uh, in the journey to complete their study in the Open University of Usa Sebuka in particular. Okay, once again, thank you very much uh, to our uh, keynote speakers and then also to uh, moderators. Before we uh, come to the end of our webinar, we would like to uh, give you uh, what's that, uh, a certificate virtually. The first uh, is uh, for uh, Dr. Maria. Please, the secretary, to share the certificate. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Maria, this is our uh, sincere ap appreciation for sharing your valuable uh, experience and also knowledge. Once again, thank you very much. And then we hope that uh, there will be one uh, occasion for us to have a webinar, this kind of webinar, so you can share uh, some uh, more information. Okay, thank you. And then the second one, this is the second certificate is uh, for uh, Professor Dr. Santi Ragavan. Thank, Thank you very you. much. And Thank this you. is our uh, token of appreciation. And the last one to our moderator, uh, Mr. Kamran Mir. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much for accepting our invitation to become the moderator. And then uh, the way you lead the discussion is very, very interesting. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once again, thank you very much. But uh, before we uh, end, I would like all to uh, turn on the camera. We have uh, we are going to have a photo uh, session virtually. Okay, first slide. Thank you. The second slide.
Thank you. The third slide. Ada berapa slide? The fourth slide. Okay, the fifth slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Once again, thank you very much for the participants who uh, we are uh, you are required to complete the feedback. It is uh, the requirements for you to receive the certificate. Remember that the certificate will be sent directly to your email address. Thank you once again very much to Professor Santi, uh, Dr. Maria, and then Mr. Kamran Mir. Thank you very much to the three of you. And then also thank you very much for all participants who are attending this webinar. Thank you very much. And wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And bye-bye from Unisa Serbuka. Thank you for having us. And all of you are invited to Open University Malaysia. Thank you. to us and come over. Thank you. Thank you all sure, very much. Sure, sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.